друг друга, знали, что в ответе за друг друга. Все в округе говорили, что... I've talked a lot about neoliberalism in these videos, so before going any further, it's worth defining what I mean by neoliberalism. You'll find plenty of definitions on the web, but my own definition is very particular. Neoliberalism is the ideology of the transnational plutocratic capitalism which dominated our planet for 30 years, from the mid-1970s to the mid-2000s. Now, these three adjectives were not chosen at random. I'm using them because they tell us something important about what neoliberalism was and how it worked. First, transnational. Neoliberalism really was a transnational system. It was never just about elites in the United States, the European Union, or Japan imposing some vision on the rest of the planet. In reality, there were neoliberal elites and politicians all over the world who forced their countries to adopt neoliberal policies. The Yeltsin government in Russia, the Menem government in Argentina, the Suharto dictatorship in Indonesia, the Mubarak dictatorship in Egypt, the list goes on and on. Second, plutocratic. A plutocracy is a tiny wealthy elite. It might surprise you to learn just how small the global neoliberal elite really is. Consultancy firm Capgemini and the Bank of America did a joint study identifying what they call high net worth individuals, which is their term for anyone on the planet who has at least a million dollars worth of assets. According to the report, there are about 11 million of these folks on the planet. Since our planet's population is closing in on 7 billion, the plutocrats are one out of every 635 people on the planet, not what you'd call a demographic majority. However, that one in 635 collectively own $42.7 trillion of wealth. Third, capitalism. This refers to the fact that our society is based on the accumulation of capital may sound simple, but it's not because capitalism is a system. It's not just about money. It's not just about a few rich people. It's not about some factories somewhere. Capitalism is a complex set of institutions, of histories, and of struggles, which are as big and complicated as the world market itself. And what this means is that transnational capitalism is a considerable challenge to describe. Fortunately, Neoliberalism is a lot like the mortgage-backed securities it used to peddle. Complicated on the outside, but pretty simple on the inside. If you break it down, neoliberalism had three core beliefs. Claim number one, plutocrats bring fairness. Markets are fair, say the neoliberals, because they're perfect. Markets never make mistakes, markets don't need regulation, and they always reward the hardworking and punish the lazy. Claim number two. Plutocrats are perfectly rational. Since markets are perfect, plutocrats know best how to run an economy. Claim number three. Plutocrats are the engine of investment. If you make your rich plutocratic elites even richer, your economy will boom. But now it's time for a reality check. One question. Does it work? Really, let's leave aside the issue of alternatives for a moment. Neoliberalism is not some crackpot ideology at the margins of society. We're talking about the ideology which has run most of the planet for the past 30 years. And nowhere was neoliberalism more dominant than the United States of America. So after 30 years in the saddle, what does the track record look like? Claim number one, plutocrats bring fairness. Reality the neoliberal era has seen inequalities explode. In the United States, neoliberalism meant tearing up the industrial base and shipping the jobs overseas. It meant busting unions. It meant states adopting undemocratic right to work for less legislation to prevent workers from joining unions. It meant lowering taxes on the rich, and it meant slashing what was already one of the most underfunded welfare states in the industrialized world. Net result? Before neoliberalism, from 1940 to 1973, real wages in the United States went up every single year. The rich did fine, but everyone else did fine too. But after neoliberalism came to America in the mid-1970s, real wages began to fall. The rich took all the money home and didn't share it with anyone else. Claim number two, plutocrats are perfectly rational. 
For 30 years, the plutocrats got richer and everyone else got poorer. Normally, this would trigger an economic crash because when the majority of the population don't have the money to buy things, the economy tanks. However, neoliberalism had an ingenious answer to this problem, creating massive amounts of debt. Instead of seeing the real wages go up, ordinary citizens took on more and more debt. Consumer debt, housing debt, student loan debt, you name it. Now, that said, the biggest debt bingers of all were not ordinary consumers. Yeah, a lot of people bought houses they really shouldn't have, but when all is said and done, the biggest and most irresponsible debt hogs of all time were not you and me. Here's a shot of the credit structure of the American economy between 1946 and 1975. This is the time before neoliberalism. Now, financial sector debt, pretty low. Household debt increases somewhat after World War II, but doesn't go very high. Corporations go a little more into debt, but not so much. The big change is the decrease in government debt, and the reason is the United States spent a lot and engaged in huge deficit spending to help win World War II. After the war, it didn't need to spend all that, and so it started to pay down the debt, and it did so in a reasonably short amount of time. So this looks like a very healthy economy. However, neoliberalism takes over in the mid-1970s, and something changes. My goodness, what happened? Well, corporations take on a little more debt, that's one change. On the other hand, government spending is not out of control. It does rise in the late 80s, early 90s, and then it decreases slightly and then it goes up. It's gone up more significantly since 2008, but over most of this period, the government is not the problem, corporations are not the problem. Now, it's true that households go deep into debt starting in the mid-1990s, and there's that sort of spike towards the end. And that's problematic. That will have to come down for households to recover, and that's mortgage borrowing. People were borrowing more than they should have for their homes. But look at the red line, financial sector debt. This was the stuff that the Wall Street firms were engaged in. And that goes from a little under 20% of GDP in the mid-1970s to well over 110% of GDP by 2008. Just an explosion of debt. Like I said, the biggest debt hogs in human history, the United States financial sector. So the same people going on and on and on about the wonders of the market precisely because they were spinning human history's biggest debt bubble. Now you might think that at least we got something for all that money, right? Like increased investment or new infrastructure, some new tech firms, right? <laughs> Claim number three, plutocrats are the engine of investment. Give the rich all your money and the society will boom. Well, we gave the rich all our money, and what did they do with it? Surprise, surprise, surprise. The more Wall Street got, the less it invested. Those are the numbers, my friends. I'm not making any of this up. Investment rates have fallen. The more control Wall Street has gotten over the economy, the less it's invested in the real economy, the less interested it is in spawning the next great innovations, and the more interested it's been in spawning more financial chaos. There's a fairly simple logic here. From the standpoint of Wall Street, why would you want to invest in a factory and get a 5% return when you can get 15% returns by cooking up a bogus CDO and selling it to some hapless pension fund? And pretty much that's what the plutocrats did. They took all this money and they gambled it on these short-term, short-run, shady investments, which were all a giant speculative bubble. And then when the bubble collapsed, they turned to the public for a huge bailout. It would almost be funny if we ordinary taxpayers weren't the ones paying up to clean up the mess. And how much did their crackpot scheme cost? Well, the latest count is close to $2.1 trillion in financial losses. And that's just the beginning. The crisis destroyed 8 million jobs in the United States alone and maybe double that number worldwide. Several millions of Americans lost their homes, 20 million Americans had to go in food stamps, while a whole generation of Americans have seen their life savings go up in smoke as their home equity vanishes. And what has Wall Street learned from this debacle? Absolutely nothing. Let me get to the blunt conclusion you reach in your book. You say that two years after the devastating financial crisis of 08, our country is still at the mercy of an oligarchy that is bigger, more profitable,
and more resistant to regulation than ever. Correct? Absolutely correct, Bill. The big banks became stronger as a result of the bailout. That may seem extraordinary, but it's really true. They're turning that increased economic clout into more political power, and they're using that political power to go out and take the same sort of risks that got us into disaster in September 2008. That's the bad news. However, there's also some good news. And the good news is that Wall Street does not own the future. Why that is, is the subject of our next chapter.